Lessons from Israel. This is going to be a little different these next four weeks, actually. are going to be a little different than typically um, how we spend our Sunday mornings when we're either going through the book of Revelation or we're diving into Hebrews 11 for 12 weeks to go through that scripture. Uh, this is going to be a little different. It's going to be more of me just sharing some things God showed me um, and shared with me uh, and excited within my spirit and so that's what we're going to be doing for the next four weeks. And we're going to start with two weeks, Lessons from Israel. And in, in honor of the place where these lessons came alive, I'm going to wear this thing. Some call it a yarmulke, and I'm not going to wear it the whole service because it feels weird when you don't wear things like this, you know. But um, others call it a kippa or a kippa. And so I'm going to put this on just for a little while, just in honor of the land where the Lord just... Uh, got these realities uh, really quickened and back alive in me. So here we go. Are you ready? And you, all of you who know me, who know my little hair issue about anybody touching my hair, you know it's a big deal. <laughs> Messing with my hair in the middle of the day is a big deal. So um, Lord, help us. And Lord, we do just come to you now. We just say, God, we thank you that you're in this place. I thank you for the time of worship that we had, that you inhabit the praises of your people, and you are truly here. And I ask God, just even as we talk about the land, Jesus, that you were born in, that you came and you stepped foot and that you ministered in, Lord, that you would cause our spirits to come alive and our hearts and our minds to be drawn to you um, and drawn to you now and to the future of, of life in you, the now and, and the, and the yet-to-come reality of who you are in our lives even today. Amen? Amen? Lesson number one from Israel. Jesus really put on flesh, and he really walked among us. He really did. We've heard the story that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. All right, i got to take it off. All right. This feels weird. Anyway, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. We've read the places like of Nazareth, Capernaum, Galilee, Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi, Caesarea by the sea. We, we've, we've heard about the Mount of Olives. We've heard about the Garden of Gethsemane. All of these places, we read about these places in our Bibles and we read stories of, of things that happened in these places involving Jesus, the Messiah. But when you step foot in those places, you know this already in your mind. You understand this in your heart that these aren't just stories, that these are real places. But when you actually get there, and you actually step foot, and you're standing on the very ground where these events happened, it, it's another sense that comes alive in you. It's a deeper reality. It's going deeper in, in the fact that this is so real. It's like you can taste it. You can smell it. You can see it because you're standing right there where this happens. So here's the deal is that what we read in the Word of God, these aren't just stories. They're not just a bunch of stories. They're not fictitious lands. It's not like Narnia or Mordor or Oz that we're talking about when we're talking Bethlehem and Nazareth and Galilee and Megiddo, Armageddon. These aren't fictitious places. These are real life places where real events happen and where the real Son of God, the Messiah, stepped out of heaven and was born and walked and ministered and called his disciples and where the church was launched. It's the real deal. And man, when you walk there, and when you spend time there, and when you pray in those places and you read God's word in those places, it's just a deeper reality. It just, it just goes in to that deep place in your inner man in just a, a new and exciting way. So these are real places, real events lived out by the real Jesus. As I return from the sabbatical, I want to dive right in and talk reality. So we're going to go for it. We're going to, these are basics, man. This is like Christian 101 basics. But isn't it interesting when, when I go to the Holy Land that that's what the Lord takes me back to, the basics. Here's the reality. Let's dive into reality. Jesus really stepped down from heaven. The Son of God 
step down from the right hand of the Father's place of, of connectivity with the Father, and he came to this earth that he created. Christ was there at creation. He created it. He came to the earth that he created, but the world was messed up because of sin. Yet he still stepped down and he put on flesh. Born a baby in a manger in a real place called Bethlehem. It was a backwater at that time. It's still kind of a crazy place when you go in there, into Bethlehem. You've got to go across this, uh, through a wall, and it's, it's, just, it's interesting. Um, he really called his disciples, who really dropped everything and really followed him and gave their lives to doing life with Jesus and being about his ministry and about the kingdom of God. Jesus really died on a cross. He really did. He went to a, a real cross. It really happened. He was placed in a grave. And on the third day, it was empty. He rose from the dead. All right, we're going to do this. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Amen. Look, I've walked where Jesus walked. I've been to Bethlehem. I've been to Nazareth. These places where he was born, where he grew up. Real places, real cities. Real life happening there right now. I've been to Capernaum where Jesus called Peter and Andrew to follow him right on the shores there of the Sea of Galilee. I've been, man, that was, a, that was a, an impactful place for me. Because it's still amazing. And we have that opportunity every single day to be just like Peter and Andrew and just say, okay. When he says, come on, let today be about me, about my kingdom. I got some exciting things for you. You ready to follow me? You ready to do it? Every day is, is, is one of those kind of days for us. Capernaum was, was awesome. I've been to that hill where Jesus preached that history-making sermon called the Sermon on the Mount that starts with those countercultural, you know, crazy statements about blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Not blessed are those who have it all together, who have it all figured out. Blessed are the poor in spirit who know they really know, need me. Because, man, they're going to have the kingdom of heaven. I've been to those places. I've, I've been along the Sea of Galilee. I've been on the Sea of Galilee. Velvet wouldn't let me try to walk on the Sea of Galilee. She, you know, I mean, I said, baby, I've got the faith. I can do it. And anyway, I didn't try to do that. But the Sea of Galilee, this is where Jesus spoke to the storm. By the way, the Sea of Galilee, I was a little unimpressed. It's, a lot, it's like a medium-sized lake. I grew up in Minnesota. You know, I've been around big lakes and stuff. And, and when you think of a sea, you think of, man, a sea, right? Like almost an ocean type thing. This is just like a medium-sized lake. You can totally see the other side. You think you could drive a golf ball from one side to the other. I don't think you really could. Um, but uh, it, just, it was a little unimpressive. And you're thinking, what must have happened for there to be that kind of storm and to cause these fishermen, these men who grew up, who made their living on this lake. It's also called Lake Gennesaret. I like that better because it really is a lake in my opinion. But Sea of Galilee, who made their living on that, to be so afraid for it to be such a storm that they're worried for their lives. Yet in their fear, they cried out to Jesus and Jesus calmed that storm with a word. He calmed that storm. He's still calming storms in our lives. Same sea where Jesus was walking on the water and called Peter to walk, and he walked on water as he had his eyes on Christ. Amazing. We worshiped when we were on boats on the Sea of Galilee, a big worship time together. It was glorious. It, it, was, it was quite impressive. I've been to Golgotha. Well, let me, let me do this. Before I talk about Golgotha, let me talk about Gethsemane because that was extremely impactful to me. I mean, this is the place, the Garden of Gethsemane. This is the place where Jesus was actually sweating blood. This is the place where Jesus was wrestling with the Father, was wrestling with the reality of what he was about to do. Go to the cross. Take on the sin of the world. This is the man who knew no sin. 
No sin. Not even a little one knew no sin, yet he was about to take on the entire sin of all creation, of the entire world. He was about to endure separation from the Father for the first time, and he's wrestling with that. He's wrestling with that. Sweating blood, wrestling. But then he says, but not my will, but yours be done. And the will of the Father was to save us, for him to be the Savior of the world. And so he did the will of the Father. Here's a short video I snuck away and recorded when I was there. Greetings, Evident Life Church family. I'm here at the Garden of Gethsemane, the, the beginning place of the passion of Jesus. In Matthew 26, it records Jesus as saying that his soul is sorrowful to the point of death. It indicates that he was even to the point of, of sweating blood. He prayed to the Father and he said, Father, if it's possible, take this cup from me, but not my will, but yours be done. Jesus was about to go through the suffering of the cross, but greater than the suffering, the physical pain and suffering of the cross, was Jesus was about to take on sin. This was the Messiah, the Lamb of God, the one who was righteous without any sin, was about to take on the sin of the world. Jesus understood that he was about to experience something even more traumatic than the sin of the world. He was going to experience separation from the Father for the first time. Okay. In the midst of his anguish, Jesus chose to do the will of his Father. He endured the separation. He took on the sin of the world and the suffering of the cross because of love, because of love for his Father and because of love for us. Beloved, my prayer, and I know the heart of Jesus, is that we would be those, that you would be that person who receives this love, who lives in this love, and who enjoys this unrelenting, unfailing love of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Amen. That's the message from the Garden, Gethsemane. And then we had the opportunity to go to the place where they believe was the hill of the skull, Golgotha, the place where Jesus was crucified. And close to that is a tomb that they call the garden tomb that could have been, at least it was a tomb very much like this tomb, where Jesus was laid after giving his life on the cross. You want to talk about impactful. Processing that reality, that good news of what Christ has done for us and that the grave is empty. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. So Jesus is not a story. He's not a character. He's not a concept. He's real. He really lived. He really walked. He's really rescued us. He's everything we hope for and everything we need. Jesus is the Messiah. For God truly so loved the world that he really did give his only son. And his only son, Jesus, really did come down. And he really did provide the way of salvation in him and through him and him alone. It's the real deal. Not a story. It's reality. I made mention to this earlier. You know, you, you contemplate and you, you think about all the amazing things that, that happened in the ministry of Jesus in these lands, in these places, all the miracles that Jesus did. You think of, of the lives that were saved, that were restored because of the life and the ministry of Jesus. You think of those healings. You think of, of Jesus bringing back the dead. And I'm here to say he's still doing it today. That's, that's the miracle. That's the power of the grace of Jesus. It wasn't just a three-year spectacle and, and, and glorious moment in history. It was only the beginning of reality, the beginning of, of the new normal now in the new covenant that we find in Christ Jesus of the kingdom of God being near and being here and still coming in its fullness. 
You see, Jesus is still healing sick people. He's still calming storms in people's lives, in relationships, in families, in marriages. He's still raising the dead. And we know He's raising us spiritually from death to life, but He's still raising even people physically from death to life. And we've seen that happen in and through this church with Jacob Lomo. One moment He's pronounced dead. For hours He's pronounced dead. And then He's alive again. And he's well. And he's walking and he has all this brain. It's a, God is God. He's the same today as he was those 2,000 years ago when he was walking and moving and ministering in those places. He's still doing it and we get to be involved in it now. Just like the disciples. They got to see it. They got to do it. He sent them out. He said, now go do the things I was doing. Cast the devil out. Stomp on the devil push back darkness, bring the light, bring the kingdom. Those guys did it, and now we are the ones who get to do this with Jesus, the one who is every bit alive today as he was 2,000 years ago, walking from Bethlehem to Nazareth to Capernaum to Caesarea to Jerusalem to the cross and then out of the grave. He is risen. Amen. Lesson number one, Jesus really put on flesh and walked among us. Let me dive right into lesson number two. We're running out of time. Lesson number two, you can find it on a bumper sticker, probably on your way home. No Jesus, no peace. N-O Jesus, N-O peace. There is no peace apart from the Prince of Peace. Never going to find real peace apart from Jesus. So we read in Scripture in Psalm 122, verse 6, that we are to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and we must pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We're called to do that. God wants us to be praying. In fact, prayer is the most powerful thing we can do in, 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 making, in seeing change happen in, in the Middle East, in Jerusalem, and really anywhere in the world in any life. Prayer is the most powerful thing we can do. That's why at Evident Life Church we're a people of prayer. A people of prayer. Pursuing God and loving others. The taproot of Evident Life Church is prayer. It's the deepest, most dominant root of our church. It's where the nutrients of the kingdom of God, of the Spirit of God come from. It comes from the place of prayer. Prayer is powerful not because of the words we speak, but because of the one that we are, we are talking with and, and interacting with and, and coming to because of God. And so we must pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We're called to do that, and our prayers will be impactful. However, there will never be peace in Jerusalem. There will never be world peace. There's never going to be peace in a marriage, peace in a family, uh, peace in our hearts, in our minds, in our soul, in our inner man. We're never going to have true peace apart from Jesus being the Lord of Jerusalem being the Lord of our nation, being the Lord of our marriage, of our family, of our heart, of our lives. We're never going to have true peace. We can experience ceasefires, and we find that around the world from time to time. There's a ceasefire, and there's this apparent um, peace that's, 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 that's pervading, that's happening in our world, but we all know it's temporary. It's temporary. It's not real. It's not the real deal. It's here today, it's gone tomorrow. The only way to have lasting true peace is Jesus. He is the Prince of Peace. And Israel doesn't have peace right now. I want to show you this video that I shot when I was at the Golan Heights. I'm standing here on the border of Israel and Syria on the Golan Heights. Behind me there is smoke, there are bombs actually going off right now, rockets that are being let loose right now in Syria. But it's not coming from Israel, and it's not rockets that are being launched from Syria into Israel. Rather, this is Syrians fighting amongst themselves. Jesus told us, it's recorded in John 10.10, 10, that the enemy comes to rob, to kill, and to destroy. 
And this is going on right now. This is an example of what happens when the enemy has his way in a country, in a people, in a region. Church, we need to be praying for the people of Syria. It's God's desire that they would know Jesus, that they would know peace. Jesus said that he came that they might have life and that to the full. And I believe that that is what he wants for the people of Syria. And so let that be our prayer for the people of Syria and for those all around the world who are having to endure violence because of a culture of death. May Jesus come and may he come soon. Amen. Amen. So there's no peace. Not really. No peace. In fact, two days after... Uh, we were there at the Golan Heights and, and staying in Tiberias on the Sea of Galilee. Two days later, they, the Israeli army had to shoot down a drone that came across the Syrian border, probably an Iranian drone of some sort. They had to shoot it down and land it in the Sea of Galilee. You don't see this kind of stuff on the news over here in the West because we, we don't want that to mess up our, our political agendas and all of that kind of stuff. But this is really happening. It wasn't long after that, about a week after that, and a fighter jet came over from Syria into Israeli airspace, and they had to shoot that one down too. Peace. What peace? It's just a picture of really the chaos and the violence that's going on in the heavenlies too. You think maybe your life is all together, there's peace and all that, but there are wars in the heavenlies right now going on. And you never know what it's going to unleash. That's why we need Jesus. We need to be firmly planted in Him and Him alone. We went down in our group, our bus, our particular bus, we went down to a city called Ashkelon. It's right on the border of, on, of Gaza, right there next to Gaza, Ashkelon. And we were ministering to um, Russians who were Jewish, who just immigrated from Russia to Israel, and they needed help. They, they're starting all over with nothing. But they're coming in now to be Israeli citizens from Russia. And so we were ministering. We gave out all kinds of household goods through an organization called the Joshua Fund. Velvet was like in her element. She was amazing. She learned how to say, God loves you in Russian. And it's, um, I didn't write this down. I haven't thought of it since we've been there. Bok Lubid Vos. Bok Lubid Vos. That's God loves you in Russian. Bok lubid vas. And she would, it was mostly ladies that were coming to this, getting these resources for their families. And Velva would walk up to these ladies, young and old alike, and she would just simply look them straight in the eye and say, Bok lubid vas. And extend herself for a hug if they wanted it, and nearly everyone did. One of three reactions. One, they would chuckle, because they didn't know what to think about that. Two, they would just kind of walk away and smile a little bit. The third reaction is they would tear up and begin to weep and cry. God loves you is a powerful statement to make. People need to hear that. They need to know that. God loves you. Velvet made a lot of friends that day, but so did the Lord through, through Velvet and that ministry. Two days after, some about two days, I'm glad we got out just in time. Two days after we were in Ashkelon, rockets came over from Gaza from Hamas. They came over from Gaza into Ashkelon, into the very neighborhoods that we were ministering in, like 80 or 90 rockets. A few days later, two to 300 rockets went into another city from Gaza into Israel. This is the reality. There's no peace without Jesus. Unless he's the Lord of a life, of a region, there's going to be no peace. It's just not going to happen. I want to talk about our own lives because we can look at things from a global socio-political perspective. We can look at Israel and the Middle East. But I imagine that everyone here goes through periods in your own life of unrest. You go through periods, somebody's, yeah, you're right, amen? Periods where things aren't right, where it seems like there's warring going on. Maybe it's just in your own soul, in your own mind, Warring, your flesh, warring with your spirit, you know. It, it, maybe, it's, maybe it's unrest in, in a marriage, in a, in a family relationship of some sort. There's unrest going on in your finances, at work, 
with friends, with your neighbors who are blasting their music. Like you don't know what to, I don't know what it might be. Jesus is the answer to whatever unrest you have in your life. Bring Jesus into it. As much as is possible with you, be at peace. But the only way it's possible, I'm telling you right now, is Jesus being invited in and being established as the Lord over your life, over your relationships, over your situations, over your neighborhood, over this community, over this nation, over this world. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. The world needs Jesus. You need Jesus. I need Jesus. It says in Psalm 120, verse 6, Too long has my soul had its dwelling with those who hate peace. Have you been looking for peace in all the wrong places? I want to do something. I want to stop and I want to engage with the Lord, the Prince of Peace right now. You all ready to do some business with God? We can talk about all this. We can also step into it. We can talk about peace that comes through Christ Jesus, but we can also step into it and receive peace that comes from Jesus. And so I want to invite us. I want to actually lead us into that. Do you have strange relationships? Maybe you're dealing with depression and crazy thoughts in your own mind, warring, a war going on in your own spirit, in your own soul. Maybe you've been dealing with physical pain and unrest for a long time. It's taken its toll on you. Maybe you're feeling spiritually attacked in some way. There's violence going on spiritually in and through your life. I imagine everyone in this room, there's some kind of unrest. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's one, one of your kids. Maybe it's one of your adult kids. It's just a frustrating time right now with them. There's just unrest, and you're ready for peace to come. We need to cry out to the Prince of Peace. We need to invite him in to every area of our lives, even right now. So I want to take a moment for us to pray together, and if you're comfortable doing this, Actually, I'm going to ask you to stand up. If you're comfortable standing, you don't have to, but if you're comfortable, stand up. And I just want to lead us in a time of prayer, in a time of submitting ourselves in these situations to the Lord. If you're comfortable and you want to raise your hands, you can do that. I, I like to raise my hands because for me, it's a physical expression of surrender and desperation for God to show up that I don't have it. My hands are empty, and I need... I need God right now. So if you just want to pray this after me, just say, Jesus, I submit my life to you. You are my Lord. And Jesus, I submit my relationships. I submit my family members. I submit my marriage. I submit my finances. I give you all of my cares and concerns. You are God and I am not. I submit my past and I give you my future right now. And just say this, if you mean it, if you want it, just say, come Lord Jesus. You alone are my Prince of Peace. Come Lord Jesus. I need you. I'm desperate for you, and I give my life, everything that I am, and everything that I have to you. Amen? I want to encourage you to do something. I want you to pray a prayer like that every day. At least for a while. I mean, because if, if this has sparked something within you that you know is unrest and that you know is, is like a storm in your life, you know needs the lordship of Jesus Christ because it's just not right. If there's anything like that in your life right now, don't make this a one-time experience or a one-time prayer. Be like that persistent widow who keeps going and crying out and then 
gets justice at just the right time. I want to encourage you every morning. First thing, give your day to the Lord, give your life to the Lord, give your hopes to the Lord, and submit this area of your life to the Lordship of the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ himself. Give it to him. Let the anxiety go, because it's in his hands. How many of you need that? A little less anxiety, a little more peace, man. Man, amen. I want to give you one more piece of encouraging news from the Middle East, from Jerusalem. There are pockets of peace in Jerusalem, in Israel, right now going on. Pockets of peace that are happening in Jerusalem right now. And where do we find this? Where do we find peace? Where do we find unity among the Arabs and the Jews? We find it in the Christian community, in the church. We were in prayer meetings. We got together in prayer meetings with other groups. Uh, well, Ann Graham Lott's group and our group with Joe Rosenberg and others, we got together in a, in a prayer meeting. And in this prayer meeting with hundreds of believers were Arabs also and Jews and Christians. And well, we were all Christians because we were getting together in the name of Jesus. We were worshiping Yeshua, the Messiah, Jesus, the Son of God. We were worshiping Him in Arabic. We were worshiping Him in Hebrew and in English. We were raising our voices and our hands to the Savior of the world, the Prince of Peace. There is some peace, pockets of peace, even in Jerusalem, this place where there are bombs and rockets flying on a weekly basis. There are, there are pockets of peace, and it's found in the Christian community. So as you pray for the peace of Jerusalem, or the peace around the world, the peace in our community, be praying for the church. Because we are the ambassadors of Christ. We are the carriers of peace. Jesus is the one who will unify even the worst of enemies. He will cut away all of that other stuff and He'll bring real peace. Pray for the church around the world. And let's be the church in our world, in our community, in our time. Let's be the church, those people who are unified in Christ Jesus, so much so that people see it and go, what's going on? I want a piece of that. I need that kind of peace. It's happening in Jerusalem and Israel. It's happening in Gilbert, Arizona, in the East Valley. It's happening. Let's continue to be those who stoke that flame and pray for the church.